This is shaping up to be a perfect evening. I'm very, very grateful for Father Nelson's overly generous introduction. I'm very grateful for that. Very grateful for Father Milady's fine homiletic reflections and his take on whatever happened since Vatican II. And in good Dominican fashion, he went right to the philosophic roots of it all, that grace builds on nature, and if man's nature is not to have a nature, then grace has nothing to build upon. I wish I could be that clear. And he's a Dominican. <laughs> so I think the take on whatever happened since Vatican II also ought to be addressed by a Jesuit, at least a one-time Jesuit, and then I think you'll have something close to the whole picture. Because the Jesuits and the Dominicans agree on this matter very strongly. I agree with Father Milady very strongly, and I'm just going to go at that in a slightly different way. I'm honored to be here. I want to say it's somewhat daunting for me to be in a room where in all likelihood everybody is holier than I am. That's very daunting. And I have the highest regard for the way in which you race after holiness as consecrated religious. You race after it. And you remind those of us who don't have that call that nothing else matters when we stand before the Lord. It's that vision of that eschatological vision, as Father Milady called it, living for heaven. Nothing else really matters. That's the very heart of the consecrated life. And nothing could be more important in the church for our faithful people and for our deacons and for priests, especially for bishops. I just want to tell you one story about a bishop and then we'll forge forward. On a particular day, by the way, I'm just going to say this for the record, they asked me to stand in one place because of that TV camera. I taught for 11 years, and I always wandered. You have no idea how hard it is for me to stay in one place. <laughs> this is going to be very difficult, but I'm going to try to control myself. But I, I suppose it's good for me to do a, uh, a special penance on the first Friday of Easter, maybe to make up for some of what I missed during Lent. But anyway, on a particular day, a priest in a particular diocese died, and five minutes after he died, his bishop died. And they both went up to heaven, and the priest got there first, sitting down, and the bishop sat next to him. St. Peter came out. And the priest was sitting there, and he fully expected the bishop to be called first. And St. Peter said, No, Father, you come ahead. You got here first. And the priest thought to himself, Finally, finally, I've had to place myself second fiddle to that bishop for my whole life. But now, finally, everything is going to level off here. This really is heaven. I got here first, and I get to talk to St. Peter first. I can't believe it. So the priest talks to St. Peter, and St. Peter says, Please, enter the eternal kingdom. So the priest goes in, and he's dead curious about what's going to happen with the bishop. It was very beautiful there, but he sits down on the curb and he's going to watch, see what happens to the bishop. 
So the bishop is in with St. Peter for a short time. He enters heaven, and all of a sudden, the priest hears the sound of choirs of angels, harps, timpani, the entire heavenly host, and they come down with a chair, like the chair in which we used to carry the Pope. And they get the bishop on that chair and they hoist him up, and with a great fanfare, they parade him down the main street entrance to heaven. The priest is still sitting on the curb. So he says, you know, I know one thing. I learned one thing in theology. Once you get into heaven, you can't get kicked out. I am going to tell, I'm going to go and give St. Peter a piece of my mind. So he goes back and he says to St. Peter, look, he said, I got here first, you take me first. I thought finally we were all going to be equal. Then I'm here sitting on the curb. That bishop, he gets a big parade, he gets carried in, in triumph. It's the same as it was. I always had to shine his shoes on earth, and I guess I'm going to have to do it. St. Peter says, Father, would you please calm down? Let me explain something to you. I welcome thousands of priests here into heaven every blessed day. That's the first bishop to get in in 500 years. <laughs> so, let's all be of good cheer and pray extra hard for bishops. Whatever happened to religious life? Father Milady's answer is profound. I'm going to put it a different way, which maybe is not as clear, by quoting Pope Benedict. What happened to religious life since the Vatican Council is the effect of what Pope Benedict has called the discontinuity hermeneutic. And the discontinuity hermeneutic has its philosophical roots exactly where Father Milady says it does, its roots. By the dis, how many of you ever heard that word, discontinuity hermeneutic? Did anybody ever hear that? Some of you have. The discontinuity hermeneutic means simply that the documents of the Second Vatican Council, in some regards, were seriously misinterpreted. They were interpreted in such wise that there became the pre-Vatican II Church and the post-Vatican II Church and the post-Vatican II Church had seriously ruptured in its continuity with the pre-Vatican II Church. And thus we still have that in some instances where if someone wants to call someone else a nasty name, he or she will say to you or to me, you are pre-Vatican II. The First Vatican Council was pre-Vatican II. So was the Council of Nicaea. So was the Council of Trent. So was Jesus Christ walking the face of the earth in Nazareth of Galilee. It is heresy to say that the Holy Spirit is more present to the Church at one period of her history than in another period. That's heresy. That's completely unacceptable. The Holy Spirit guides the Church as Christ wants his Church guided down through history. 
And it's the same Holy Spirit of the same Lord Jesus. But through the misinterpretation of some of the teachings of Vatican II, we wound up in our experience of the church with a church after the council that is quite different from the church before the council, different in ways that the Second Vatican Council never intended. The discontinuity hermeneutic. That is what happened to religious life, and I'm going to go into some detail about that. But that's what happened in two words. The other issue at the roots of what happened to religious life is the conflict between religious religious communities of the consecrated life as prophetic and as ecclesial. Many religious communities, many communities of consecrated life were formed precisely to straighten out abuses in the church. And they had to be prophetic to the leaders of the church. And many of you belong to communities coming from that tradition. But communities of the consecrated life are Catholic ecclesial communities. So that prophetic call can never come into conflict with obedience to what is basically Catholic. Dissent can never be presented as prophetic when it is dissent to what is basically Catholic. To be sure, there are abuses in the church today that need to be corrected by the prophetic witness of consecrated religious. To be sure there are. But the basic truth of the faith is not up for grabs in that equation. Abuses are abuses, and truth is truth. And they have to be kept very, very clearly separate. The prophetic call of consecrated religious is to correct abuses. The truth does not admit of being corrected. So, consecrated religious must be prophetic and also ecclesial. And consecrated religious cannot be both prophetic and ecclesial if they fall victim to the discontinuity hermeneutic. So let's go a little bit more into detail about that discontinuity hermeneutic. If I can just reflect a little bit with you more specifically, I entered the Society of Jesus in 1964, during the Council. And for two years, we had the traditional Jesuit novitiate and received probably the best spiritual formation on the face of the earth. And my own prayer life still goes back to those roots. It's rare that I can give a homily without mentioning St. Ignatius and the beautiful spirituality of the spiritual exercises. I still live my life out of that. In 1966, we finished the novitiate and went to college studies in philosophy. When I went to philosophy, there were women everywhere. When I went everywhere, 
And it's great. It's great to be around women. But after just being forbidden even to take an innocent walk with a woman for two years, all of a sudden we're being told, you don't seem that comfortable around women. Maybe you have to go and get psychiatric counseling. <laughs> That's the discontinuity hermeneutic. Another manifestation of that was that during formation, for several years, I was allowed to live outside Jesuit community during time of formation. I'm not blaming anybody for anything. By God's grace, I am what I am. But to live outside of community when you're in formation for years is obviously not helpful. But it was as though all of the ground rules had been suspended. That was the discontinuity, discontinuity hermeneutic. And then I went to theology studies, where most of what I heard did not square with the faith that I learned in my family, largely from my grandmother. My grandmother was the Lord's privileged instrument in my vocation. And the faith that I got, I got from her. So I had to get through theology, so I wrote papers saying whatever they wanted me to say. But thank God for Granny, because I would go home from the class and say, I'd go over all my notes and say, which of those things would Granny not believe? And I would actually mark them, and I'd say, I want to make sure I don't believe those either. <laughs> That's the discontinuity hermeneutic. And then all of the restrictions of community life, which are a blessing to someone who's a consecrated religious, they actually free the consecrated religious, from a lot of burdens of worldly life and create a context for being brothers and sisters who are really friends of Jesus Christ in community. All of those strictures got loosened up. Clerical dress started to disappear. I was going out to buy myself new ties so that I wouldn't wear the same ones all the time when I taught and so on. That's the discontinuity hermeneutic. It didn't look at all the way it looked when I was a novice. It started to change in 66. The big change came in 68 and it was triggered by the rejection, the, the large-scale rejection of the encyclical on artificial birth control. The dissent against Humanae Vitae really triggered and set into full effect the discontinuity hermeneutic. Because once people dissented from Catholic teaching, which was also the natural law, there was no other teaching that was out of bounds for dissent. And that was the beginning of cafeteria Catholicism, as we call it, where people, including consecrated religious, including priests, and including even some bishops, gave themselves a line item veto with regard to the doctrine and the discipline of the Church, and even some cases the Ten Commandments. That's what happened since Vatican II. Pope John Paul the Great, God bless him, from 1978 he started, and he just took his time in a loving way, 
And he pretty much loved us back to the point where we could see the mistakes in his last year that were made in the interpretation of Vatican II. And finally, a few years ago, Benedict was able to put a name on the problem which John Paul the Great never did when Benedict called it the discontinuity hermeneutic. That's what happened to religious life, to consecrated life, after the council, the rupture between the pre-Vatican II Church and the post-Vatican II Church is at the root of what happened to religious life. And we see now, and it, my heart aches, because at some of the mother houses we have the elderly sisters in their habits living one kind of life and the sisters in their 50s and 60s and 70s living another kind of life and in many orders no reinforcements coming along. And when I describe the discontinuity hermeneutic, please don't hear me as blaming anyone. I have no right to blame anyone and I have no reason to blame anyone. I believe that God's Holy Spirit is always present to the church and that the permissive will of God allowed all of this in order to bring us to a better place in the church. I do believe that. So I'm not looking to blame anybody for anything. The last thing we need is any more conflict within the church. We seem to be coming to a time of that we could describe in terms of Pope Benedict's favorite word, serene or serenity. We seem to be coming to a time of greater serenity in the church. Please, God, let's hope we do. Now, in terms of being a little bit more specific about the discontinuity hermeneutic, I thought I would reflect with you on the rules of St. Ignatius for thinking within the church. These are rules that are attached to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. And the Jesuit approach is going to be kind of our specific example. At the beginning of the spiritual exercises, St. Ignatius gives us what he calls the presupponendum, the disposition that somebody should have in order to be a prayerful Catholic, in order to make the spiritual exercises. The presupponendum is basically this, that when I, when I take offense at what somebody else says or does, when I take offense, I forbear. I withhold my judgment. I put the best possible interpretation on what was said or done by the other. I put the best possible interpretation on it that sticks until I'm proven wrong and I rejoice in everything that's good about the other person at whose behavior or words I have taken offense. I withhold judgment, I forbear. I place the best possible interpretation on what was said or done and I rejoice in all that's good. St. Ignatius said that's the disposition for entering into an Ignatian retreat, that's the, that's the disposition for entering into the Catholic life so that I can have peace, so that I can have serenity. That disposition is the key to serenity. And if I don't have serenity in my life, I can't pray. I have to be at peace in order to receive the gift of prayer. And if I'm always churned up 
because I've taken offense at what this one says or what that one does, there's no way that I'm going to have a serious prayer life. That's the disposition of the Jesuit life. The goal of Jesuit education was what Ignatius called eloquentia perfecta, being able verbally and with witness to defend the faith both publicly and privately. That's what the goal of Jesuit education was, eloquentia perfecta. The disposition was give the benefit of the doubt, place the best possible interpretation, etc. The goal was eloquentia perfecta, the gift of defending the faith verbally and by witness in the public form and privately. And the other goal was the ability to look for God in all things. And I was just giving you an example of that. Rather than be angry at what happened in the church because of the discontinuity hermeneutic, wouldn't it be better to look for the presence of God in all that? St. Ignatius never promised that we would find God in all things. But the Jesuit gift was to look for God in all things, to have that attitude toward creation. So the disposition was forbearance. The goal, defending the faith in public forum and looking for God in all things. And the basic means to achieve that goal for Ignatius, the core means was obedience. Obedience was the thing, including, for Jesuits, obedience to how you get educated. There were many Jesuits over the years, before the council, who began a doctorate. There's one case where a man began a doctorate in chemical, chemical engineering. And he was writing his doctoral thesis. And a theologian who taught at a Jesuit theology died. The provincial called him up and said, forget about chemical engineering. You're going to start your doctorate in theology to take his place. Just like that. And that was the means, that kind of obedience was the means to arrive at the goal starting with the disposition, the praise up and under. I hope that that's clear. Looking at these rules for thinking within the church, there are 17 of them. We're not going to do 17, but I just want to reflect on a few of them. Rule four, we should praise religious institutes, virginity, continence, and marriage too, but not as highly as the former. We should praise marriage, but not as highly as virginity. The Second Vatican Council teaches that in Optatam Totsius, the decree on priestly formation. It's almost unknown the Vatican to affirm that. We should praise marriage, but we should praise virginity more and praise consecrated life. If there was an attitude in the church like that, consecrated life would not have gone through the turmoil that it has gone through when there were mass departures from religious life, what evidence was there that anyone was praising it? Rule for thinking within the church, number four. Number eight, 
we ought to praise ornamentations and structures of churches, also images and their veneration. Our cathedral church in Madison was burnt down. I have to build another one. There are not a few who say, why do you need that? Take the insurance money, give it to the poor, and forget it. And so often people forget that above all, the poor need a beautiful place where they can pray and experience their dignity before God. Really poor people can't get into beautiful museums or beautiful restaurants. And really poor people still need God more than they need any earthly good. And churches and cathedrals say to the poor, come here and experience not only earthly beauty, but come here and experience the beauty of God himself. But another instance of the discontinuity hermeneutic. Religious life has not been esteemed the way it ought to be. Churches and structures and their ornamentations are, haven't been praised the way they ought to be. Rule 11. We ought to be more inclined to praise the determination of superiors than to be against them. But, St. Ignatius adds, we should speak of bad conduct on the part of superiors to the persons who can bring about a remedy. To the persons who can bring about a remedy. In religious communities and in the diocesan priesthood. Do we really place a positive attitude toward the determination of superiors rather than be against them. Too often we become the way it has to be in the military where the troops get together and gripe about the top brass. As I look at these, it's hard for me to believe that I was taught these, that we were taught them. Rule 12, and Ignatius is right on the discontinuity hermeneutic here. It's better for someone not to make statements like so-and-so, who's alive right now, knows better than St. Augustine. Or so-and-so is another St. Francis. So-and-so is another St. Paul. St. Ignatius said, don't get it into your blood that the present is better than the past. Don't take that for granted. Don't slip into that. That's a rule for thinking within the church. Rule 13 is really the blockbuster. What I see as white I will believe to be black if the hierarchical church thus determines it. I think a lot of people feel no one would dare say that today. That would be so politically incorrect we wouldn't know what to do with it and that would be called a a power trip on the part of the bishop or whatever. St. Ignatius did not believe in blind obedience, in mindless obedience. But he thought 
that the will of the superior, apart from commanding sin, the will of the superior was God's will, and if I didn't see it, I could tell the superior that, but then I would try to conform my judgment to the superior's judgment. I would ask about it, try to understand why the superior did what he or she did. But that I would give the decision the benefit of the doubt again. What I see is white, I will believe to be black if the hierarchical church thus determines it because Christ and the church are enlivened by the same Holy Spirit. That's almost a foretelling of the discontinuity hermeneutic and its refutation by St. Ignatius. Rules 14, 15, and 17 are very interesting. They're a little dated now because they talk about the uh, nature grace, the nature grace controversy, the Dominicans and the Jesuits and so on. And St. Ignatius says, don't talk about those things among people who are not really acquainted with it because they're going to be misled. And I think if St. Ignatius were alive today, he would say, don't talk to people about the intricacies of following their conscience, because they can be easily misled. Don't talk to people about whether or not the church, the body of Christ, is separate from Christ. Could Christ be equally present in other religions? Are other religions equivalent in terms of the presence of Christ in their own way? Don't talk about things like that to people who are not prepared because then they get confused and they're led into sin by their own confusion. Be careful what you say to people about the teaching of the church. Give them as much as they can handle. Don't give them too much. It's like situations doesn't happen too much anymore. On the feast of the Epiphany, the priest gets in the pulpit and he says, you know, it doesn't, doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that there were three wise men, that there were three. That's true. But Granny's been coming for years looking at the three of them. Right up there, she, she thinks it's wonderful. She likes to see the camel. She thinks it's great when the kids see the camel. She thought it was great that an African person was included. She saw those three for years, and then he gets in the pulpit and tells her, well, there, maybe there weren't three at all. What good does that do if one wants to think within the church. And the last rule is praise both love and fear of the divine majesty because even servile fear can lead to filial fear and filial fear will lead to love. God is not our pal. If I took each of those rules and asked the question, what rule was being followed in the mid-70s? The rules that were being followed in the mid-70s would be almost the opposite. That's the discontinuity hermeneutic. 
The discontinuity hermeneutic took its toll on the liturgy. It's one of the main reasons why Benedict is bringing back a wider availability of the traditional Latin Mass, because that liturgy could not have been prohibited. There is continuity. People have a right to that. The discontinuity hermeneutic hermeneutic took its toll on poverty, what that means. Does it just mean I share generously what I have with others? Chastity, I'm not exclusive in my love, I love everybody. That's what it means. Obedience, creative decision making in community. That's what happened. The discontinuity hermeneutic in most, if not all, instances. And the openness to dissent in the name of conscience, frequently called not dissent, but in fact creativity. If we look at some of those rules for thinking within the church, as we learned them in 1964, and then look at what we were doing in 1975, 76, that's what happened to religious life. It happened to the whole church. And it's taken us 40 years to begin to fine-tune and clarify. Really, the last point that I want to make is very simple. Jesus Christ never proved his freedom by disobedience. In our day and age, because as Father Milady said, man's nature is not to have a nature, people prove their freedom by disobedience. They feel their freedom. And Jesus Christ, St. Paul tells us, was never alternatively yes and no to his Father. He was never anything but yes. He humbled himself, taking upon himself the nature of a slave. He became obedient unto death even death on a cross. Letter to the Hebrews, Jesus Christ learned obedience through what he suffered. The behavior of Jesus Christ in terms of his Father over and over and over again in Scripture is obedience. The word is used at least 92 times of Christ in the New Testament. Obedience. And of course, in that deepest sense of obedire, obaudire, to listen. And as we look to the future, I think for the new institutes of religious life and the new secular institutes and the old ones. I think the key issue is a return to authentic obedience because it unites the prayer aspect, listening hard to God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Lord alone. That commandment could just as well say, Obey, O Israel. The Lord our God is Lord alone, and you're not. So listen hard. Be obedient. The prayerful dimension and the behavior dimension, I think, will come together beautifully integrated in the old religious and secular institutes, and in the new new ones, if 
Obedience is at the core. Because Jesus Christ was all about love. And how did he love? He humbled himself, becoming obedient. Jesus' love in the concrete is obedience. And that's why the church has to work like, it's a bad image in a way, but it's like a a well-oiled machine if it's driven by obedience. Obedience is the engine that drives the church because it was the engine that drove Christ's relationship to his Father. And the church is the body of Christ. Many of the new communities, I, the one that comes most immediately to mind is the neocatechumenal way, have a very profound and radical kind of obedience attached to membership in them, even for lay people. A very radical obedience, like the obedience of Christ to the Father. Nothing in our day could be more counter-cultural. Nothing could be more counter-cultural. Everybody has to prove his or her freedom precisely by disobedience. Christ proved his freedom by obedience. Of course, Christ is a divine person with a divine nature and a human nature. But Mary is a human being raised in glory. And more than any other human being ever could, she proved her freedom by an absolute obedience. And in that is her holiness, the holiness which the consecrated life is called to embody. The discontinuity hermeneutic has taken its toll on all of us. But the Holy Spirit has not ceased to be present to his church teaching her to be obedient to Christ through legitimate authority in the church, unworthy though those of us are who are called to exercise that authority. The healing of the discontinuity hermeneutic will come about when there is true obedience. And lastly, if we think about it, poverty is a form of obedience, listening to God's command. Chastity is a form of obedience, listening to God's command. Obedience could never be said to be a form of poverty. They're different. Obedience could never be said to be a form of chastity. They're different. But both poverty and chastity are forms of obedience. That prayerful listening to God, presence to him, and acting out his will as it is given to me to do by the church. We've been through a difficult period. We have to ask for the grace not to be angry or resentful about that. Just to stand in awe of the Holy Spirit leading us through a situation that we simply can't understand. We're not angry, we don't resent, we don't hold any hold it against anybody. We're not looking for people to blame. But what we are doing is doing what we can to build on what John Paul the Great started, 
and what Benedict is doing now. We have to listen hard to God and follow his will, even in very new and radical ways. And I think the newer communities are moving that way, and the more traditional communities are returning in that direction. But there really is no other way for us as disciples of Jesus Christ than the path of unfailing and loving obedience because there was no other way for Christ. And that loving and faithful obedience led him back to heaven, but it was not a direct flight, the hub of the air carrier that Jesus took was on Mount Calvary. There were no direct flights to heaven. All the flights to heaven, according to the mind of Jesus, stop at Calvary. And so it should surprise no one of us that obedience leads to Calvary. But the flight goes on, and obedience leads us to heaven as surely as it led Jesus and our Mother Mary there for all eternity. Obedience takes us to Calvary, but obedience is full of hope because Calvary is never the end of the road for us. So as religious, let's keep our eyes fixed on the joy of heaven, especially in those moments when obedience takes us for some moments on Mount Calvary. I don't think there is any other key to a serene and sure future for consecrated religious and for members of secular institutes. The core value of obedience is essential. That's how the discontinuity hermeneutic gets candled, canceled out. Thanks for listening to me tonight, and God bless you.